afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Belinda Ray, Business Development Manager at the Ontario Centers of Excellence. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and welcome to Discovery. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of Enbridge, the sponsors of this presentation theater. I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel discussion, Building Smart Connected Communities from the Ground Up. Today, this session will explore the sustainable, beneficial reuse of soil and highlight the strategic importance of using innovative solutions and approaches to remediate, redevelop, and revitalize lands to provide lasting benefit to future generations while protecting the environment. To guide us through the discussion is Mr. Al Duran. Al is the chairperson of the Technical Advisory Committee of the Canadian Brownfields Network. Recently, he was a contributor to the development of the online decision support tool the redevelopment framework for former service stations in the province of Ontario. Al continues to be actively involved in environmental and brownfield related redevelopment initiatives. Welcome Al and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here and have this opportunity to lead this discussion on what I consider to be a, a very important uh, topic. Now, at the end of the day, some people may say it's just dirt, and it is, but we're going to look at it in a different context, which has to be the approach taken when dealing with the beneficial reuse of soils. Uh, just to give you some background and context for our discussion today on sustainable and beneficial reuse of soil, I'd like to hit a couple of points. Uh, one, right off the top, there are many, many challenges involved here. Current regulations and definitions are in essentially fail-safe mode and they discourage the beneficial soil reuse, particularly in Ontario, where it tends to have treatment as a waste and the attached stigma that comes with that. There are many, many different players and levels of approval involved with varying layers of expertise and political sensitivities when dealing with these issues, the biggest one being NIMBYism, and you're all familiar with that, I'm quite sure. Uh, there are different sector complexities and barriers that make an all-inclusive solution or a simple solution a real challenge in dealing with all the aspects. What's driving this, this change in terms of beneficial reuse? Well, growing infrastructure, particularly in Ontario, urban intensification, all the things you're aware of, that generates soil, excess soils to be dealt with. There are limited dwindling landfill capacity for excess soils if it is treated and continues to be treated as a waste. So there's a need to do things in a better way, a more sustainable way, a smarter way. There's, at the end of the day, the need to treat excess soils as a beneficial resource as opposed to a waste. It's that simple. We need strategy, strategic policy to establish innovative technology and process applications. I come from the petroleum industry and working particularly for a large company, it's all about process. The best technology in the world is no good if you don't have good process and good regulations that support it. So it all goes hand in hand. As a result, there's a bit of a need for a regime change from, on the regulatory side, a view of enforcement of regulations to a mode of encouragement, whereby regulations are progressive and they encourage the development of new innovation and process applications. Uh, that will involve a complexity that probably goes far beyond the ability of hardcore legislation and regulation to deliver. It means industry codes of practices, standard operating practices, and things at the appropriate work level that get the job done to ensure that excess soil is not treated as a waste but as a beneficial project. And lastly, the big issue, tying back to NIMBYism, is the need for community engagement. Again, no matter what the technology, the process involved, at the end of the day, there has to be a location where beneficial soil treatment takes place, and that's a big community issue, a big PR, a big media issue. Having said that, I'd like to describe briefly the panel format that we're going to be following. I will introduce the panelist speakers in order. Each panelist will speak for approximately five minutes. Now, they all have a lot of experience, a lot of good material. They could talk forever. However, we are the last session of the day, so there is an opportunity we're finished for more direct one-on-one -on -one questions. So the five minutes is really just an introduction. At the conclusion of these presentations, there will be a moderated discussion where I will present 
some questions to each of the panelists. At the conclusion, we will open it up for audience questions. Uh, please use microphones uh, when you have a question. Identify yourself and your company or sector that you represent and who the question is directed to on the panel. Uh, we are also very conscious of time. We realize uh, that we are the last presentation late in the day, and I was told when I took Speaking 101, the last thing you want to do is be the last person speaking between the audience and the bar. So we're very cognizant of that. I would like to start by introducing our panelists. Uh, if you want more detail, please go to the Discovery website where you'll see a full uh, biographical information on each of the speakers in more detail. Uh, I was going to say to my right, but more appropriately behind me, is our first panelist, Dr. Jason Garrard, Canadian Research Chair in Geoenvironmental Remediation at Western University. He has spent over 15 years researching soil and groundwater contamination and developing innovative remediation technologies. He is also the co-inventor of a novel technology for eliminating toxic compounds in soil in a highly sustainable manner. I think you'll find that interesting when he talks about it. Welcome, Jason. Next to Jason is David Harper, president of Kilmer Brownfield Equity Fund Team. David is responsible for environmental risk management of the fund's investments at Kilmer. In 2011, the Canadian Urban Institute recognized and selected David as the Brownfielder of the Year. This is the industry's highest form of recognition for personal achievement in the area of brownfields. David is also a professional with the Association of Geoscientists of Ontario. Thanks for being with us today, David. Next, we have Andy Manahan, Executive Director of the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario, or RCCAO. RCCAO is an alliance composed of construction industry management and labour groups, an interesting arrangement. RCCAO's goal is to work in cooperation with governments and related stakeholders to offer realistic solutions related to infrastructure investment, regulatory reform, and other issues of significance. And the beneficial reuse of excess soils is one of those high interest issues to RCCO right now. Welcome, Andy. Uh, last but not least, apologies, Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette Southwood is an award-winning engineer and principal and global and sustainable cities leader at Golder Associates a world-renowned environmental company. Jeanette leaves a multidisciplinary global and national team group in strategic integration of cutting-edge international innovation and knowledge into economical, effective, and reliable local solutions, local solutions for public and private clients. Welcome, Jeanette, and thank you to all of you for being one of our panelists. I'd like to start off with uh, Jason, please. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, so I'll just say a few words about uh, some of the uh, work that we're doing at Western about innovation for new technologies for remediating soil and groundwater. Uh, just to set the context, since I'm speaking first, uh, I'll say a few things. Uh, there has not been very many uh, good databases of the number of contaminated sites in Canada. There's much more information available in America. Uh, but we had a recent survey that shows uh, uh, at least 13,000 federally owned contaminated sites that have not yet been cleaned up. And that gives us some kind of uh, indication of the scope of the problem. We, there's an unknown number of provincial sites, public, private sites, orphan sites that aren't counting this number. Ju just the federal sites are estimated to have a price tag of environmental liability in excess of $7 billion. So the overall problem, uh, that's just uh, federally in Canada, if you multiply that by all of Canada and then all of North America and the rest of the world, we're faced with an no, enormous environmental liability from 100 to 150 years of industrial activity. Um, of course, uh, those contaminants in the subsurface have uh, significant threats to the environment and also to uh, human health. And with uh, climate change and water scarcity issues coming up, uh, as well as um, the fact that some of the easiest sites have been cleaned up and we're left with many, many of the most difficult sites, uh, we face a very significant technical, regulatory, uh, environmental problem. So 
one of the issues is that uh, although we've been working on research on cleaning up these soils and groundwater for at least 20 years now, uh, very few of the most problematic sites have actually been completely cleaned up. Um, and some of the most problematic contaminants include some of the ones I've listed here. Heavy metals, uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, chlorinated organic liquids, those include uh, chlorinated solvents such as TCE and PCE, which you find uh, uh, associated with the electronics industry and degreasing uh, processes. Uh, the petroleum hydrocarbons associated with, of course, uh, oil uh, acquisition, oil refining, oil transport. Uh, and also the TARs and PAHs that are associated with, for example, uh, the asphalt industry and also uh, uh, manufactured gas plants, uh, which were in almost every town and city across the industrialized world before natural gas was used, for example, for gas, for street lighting. So at Western, we're doing uh, maybe uh, 10 to 12 different kinds of projects, all focused on understanding how contaminants move and, distri are, and distribute in the subsurface, better ways of detecting them, finding them, tracking them during remediation, and also innovative methods for actually remediating, it, remediating them and cleaning them up. I'm only going to speak about two just to give you an example of the kinds of new things coming down the pipe. I'll talk about one innovation that focuses on chlorinated solvents and another that focuses on the TARs and the PAHs. So nanoparticles, as you know, are, is, is a rage uh, of new possibilities associated with these uh, uh, innovative uh, particles. Nanoparticles are, are on the order of one one thousandth of the diameter of a human hair. And they have very uh, uh, special properties, such as a very high surface area to volume ratio that allows them to be very reactive. So if we have reactive compounds, we want to inject them into the subsurface, get them to what we call the source zone, the source of our soil and groundwater contamination and allow a reaction to occur that destroys the solvents in situ. Um, we're focusing on Western on developing these particles with special coatings. So we team up with the chemical engineering department and we use those uh, special coatings to allow them to travel a long distance in the subsurface. So for example, we inject them here and we want to transport them through the soil to the source zone where that reaction can occur without them precipitating out or clogging the pore space. We've had really good success with some new technology there. And I want to acknowledge uh, uh, an array of sources and my colleague Dennis O'Carroll who's leading that project. There's also the STAR technology that we're developing right now, which is pretty exciting. And this is for those TARs and uh, hydrocarbons, which are really hard. They, they don't degrade about 100, 150 years later. They really haven't changed at all in all that time. They, will remain in the subsurface uh, because they resist natural degradation processes. So we're looking at injecting a, a short amount of energy uh, and developing a smoldering reaction, which is essentially what happens in a traditional barbecue when you have glowing red charcoals. It's a combustion reaction that releases energy. Uh, once you start the reaction going, it can continue by itself, and that's why it's called self-sustaining treatment. So we apply a little bit of energy, those, uh, glo those globules of oil start to glow red, we blow some air in, and that reaction can continue even after we turn off the energy source, and it'll continue until all the contamination is gone. And we've done this, we've done over 100 experiments at many different scales, and uh, what we see is that uh, we can have very contaminated soil. This is an example of an ex situ application. We've also done it in situ for coal tar. And we have a little, we, we uh, apply a little bit of energy uh, and then uh, we basically let it, leave it alone and 24 hours later we take the top off and we have basically soil that is not any more classified as a waste. It could be reused. So uh, the beauty of uh, smoldering is it's very destructive. And that's really one of the keys of the newest innovative technologies that you want, don't want to transfer the contaminants to the air phase for treatment or transfer them to the water phase for treatment. We want to completely destroy them and remove them from the environment. Uh, also, we want to attack maybe not the groundwater plume that you'll be treating for 100 years. We want to actually treat the, the contaminant in the source zone uh, and apply a technology in situ uh, so we're not dredging up all that material and trucking it off site for treatment. We want to treat it on site and even without removing it from the ground. Uh, and of course, now these days we're looking for very sustainable technologies like STAR 
that use very, very little energy, so they're very, very cost efficient, uh, they're destructive, uh, and they have a very low carbon footprint. And so there's some exciting things coming, and, and research is helping bring it to the first stage before it moves to, you know, obviously, uh, eventually to commercial uh, application. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk more about some bigger picture um, processes that are driving maybe the requirements for the management of excess soils and tie it back into how technology has an influence on we consider uh, future um, better ways to manage this material. I think if you look around any urban environment right now in Ontario or in Canada, you'll see that we're fortunate that our economy is still moving forward. There's a lot of development projects underway. And the, and the trend right now, and particularly you see this in Ontario, a lot of the new uh, growth strategies for urban settings is to basically intensify within urban boundaries. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, intensification talks about utilizing transit corridors. It talks about um, taking advantage of existing infrastructure that's already present and, uh, and also affords the opportunity to, you know, to uh, build today, uh, let's say, considering uh, more efficient ways to conserve energy and water. And so it's a real opportunity, but with that opportunity um, becomes a realization that many of these intensification sites are being recycled from a previous use. Industries, um, and quite frankly, you know, just through normal operations, the land itself has been impacted over the years of uh, former activity. And so with that, we have to deal with the impacted soil that we, um, that we come in contact with. So what we do at Kilmer is we invest in these intensification projects and deal with, again, the technology issues associated with restoring these sites, but also having to deal with other barriers that exist in the brownfield marketplace um, that have to do with liability um, and also uh, reusing materials. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that through my few slides. This is just a, a bit of an overview of why our fund exists. Um, anybody that's involved in, let's say, contaminated real estate, uh, quite frankly, is subject to greater risks. Um, because uh, of the environmental nature of the sites, traditional lending like banks have a tendency to shy away from the work and it can take three to four years to basically deal with these properties before they're ready for the next phase, which is build out. Quite frankly, by the time you've dealt with all the environmental issues on the site uh, and uh, have attained the regulatory approvals, because it is a heavy regulated business with the Ministry of Environment, um, that's when the when your conventional financing will come into place, and that could be four years out. So there's a lot of costs that can be incurred to prepare this land for redevelopment, and that's what our fund specializes in. And that's all this slide is really attempting to show is the long timeline. And I think the key thing to take from that is why we have this tendency to want to dig and dump sites is because it speaks to how quick we can take this problem that exists on this property and essentially just move it elsewhere. You know, the timing of that is something we can control in more of the timeline of months as opposed to years. And that's been a bit of a barrier as it relates to how we look at technology on uh, brownfield sites and how we uh, reuse materials. Quite frankly, there's the way you deal with most brownfield sites is similar uh, in terms of the approach or the process. You need to know what you're going to build first. And quite frankly, if you know what you're building, then you can take a look at, like, are you in a soil deficit or you need to remove materials just to allow the site to be developed. For example, a condo building in downtown Toronto, you have to extract, you know, four or five levels of underground parking. So why would you want to try and treat soils on site if that's the case? So understanding what you're building is a key concept and one of your first uh, sort of filters as you look at soil management. And then you go through the process of identifying what your other criteria are for cleanup. Again, this is a heavy regulated business and then you need to look at technologies to get you to these regulatory approvals um, that ultimately allowed you to build the site out uh, for its next use. And you have a well-developed engineering and geo 
science community in the province of Ontario that you retain to assist you in this process. But the point here is that, again, depending on the development, you te pick technologies. Um, in the first uh, picture up there, this was a site that has now townhomes and condos. They extracted 200,000 cubic meters of soil from that property, but they really had no use for that. So, again, how do we manage all that excess soil coming from a fairly impacted location? And the second example, what they did there, they didn't have to remove any material but they, what they created is a barrier system between the building and, and the, uh, in the gr subsurface ground. And so what you're seeing there is a, a liner system that's actually underneath the building. So there's a number of approaches and engineered solutions that you can consider, but you first need to know what the built form is. You know, what is sustainable remediation? Everyone is jumping on sustainability. I mean, it's a very good question. We, we look at it and in our projects and trying to measure it. And so there are methods to, again, evaluate different remedial processes. And this is just an example of one of the methods that we used when we were applying for a, a technology grant from the federal government. And anyway, at the end of the day, through that work, we were able to determine that we could reduce greenhouse gases by over 75% if we got away from a dig and haul type uh, remedial approach and dealt with more in situ remediation on site. But again, every property is different on whether you would consider that depending on the built form. This is a couple examples of some of the more innovative remedial work we've been doing. Certainly, a bioremediation is something that's been well developed for the last, I'd say, 10 years or so, both in Quebec, Ontario, and other jurisdictions. And certainly, we use it on hydrocarbon sites. And again, it depends on the nature of the hydrocarbons. Certainly, some of the hydrocarbons aren't as well suited for bioremediation. But uh, gasoline service stations are, and some lighter end hydrocarbons. So it's a very well-defined technology that gets us to where we want to be again in that timeline of months as opposed to years. Another technology we've been using a lot and it relates to chlorinated solvents is the uh, iron technology that was developed through the University of Western Ontario or Waterloo excuse me and uh, we've been using that to mix in place to deal with chlorinated impacts in groundwater and we've used these approaches in combination at different sites and again, we've been able to still maintain a very tight timeline. And, and in, in this property and another one that we have in uh, Toronto, uh, we were able to maintain over 30,000 tons or cubic meters, rather, of material to the property for beneficial reuse. And so there is a lot of advantage to considering these other approaches. And what are we building on these sites? Again, this is important to recognize that many of these properties, again, were former industrial sites. They're not suitable for single family home developments with below grade basements. So we're using the built form also to help manage some of the environmental issues that linger on these properties because you'll never return it to a greenfield state. And what we mean by that are these types of developments, either high rise, which again, everyone get their headers around like the condo development, but also these mid rise, uh, townhomes with uh, parking as the first use. And there's a regulation that complements soil management that allows for less sensitive use and contact with the ground. It's similar to that liner system, but here you're putting parking garages, and quite frankly, this is the type of built form that's really sort of being looked at in these urban intensification projects. So again, it's a combination of technology, process, and what you're building on that site that drives you know, how you manage your excess materials. Thank you very much. Uh, as Al mentioned, uh, we represent uh, road builders, uh, sewer and water main contractors, and as well we have the labor component. So these are the folks that are actually doing the construction on site. So I guess uh, David focused a little bit on, I guess, residential. I'll try to limit my comments to more uh, civil type infrastructure projects. Um, what we're um, finding right now is that uh, while there has been a regulatory framework to help deal with uh, redevelopment of brownfield sites, the movement or management of excess construction soils for typical infrastructure projects has not really been well enunciated. Uh, there's essentially no framework under the Ministry of the Environment to deal with excess soils. So uh, as Al was mentioning during his introduction, uh, when lenders are um, looking to uh, 
limit their own liability, they will gravitate to certain tables uh, that have been designed more so for brownfield redevelopment. So right now, uh, I guess over the last number of years, uh, there's been a heightened awareness of what's happening here. Um, the building together uh, infrastructure plan that the province of Ontario released last summer talks about uh, $35 billion uh, being spent over three years on all types of infrastructure, all the way from hospitals to sewer and water main and bridges and so forth. And we're very concerned because um, we took a look at uh, various projects uh, in this region, both civil and institutional, and found that um, the cost of uh, moving and disposing of excess soils represented between 4 and 18 percent of the capital cost of infrastructure projects. So just to take a simple number, I know David Kaplan, who is a former infrastructure minister, talked about the need in Ontario of about $100 billion worth of infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, it's probably at least $10 billion of that will be just on the movement of uh, construction soils. And from our sector, uh, certainly, you know, we recognize you have to deal in a highly regulated environment, but we would certainly like to spend more of that money on actually building infrastructure than on moving soils around the province. Um, there are situations, um, for example, with highway projects in Ontario uh, where there's a bit more space involved where you can have a berm of the soil that's used from the project and sometimes you can soil bank it and move it to another project. But uh, for example, and I'll show this uh, next shot here, this is quite nearby. This is in front of uh, Union Station with the re revitalization and in the background you can see the Royal York Hotel. So. If there's a, a sewer uh, or a water main break uh, on this street, let's say in front of the Royal York, um, the current MOE uh, best management practice that just came out talked about the need for uh, developing a fill management plan and having qualified persons at both source and receiving sites. Um, I don't think the patrons of the Royal York would be too happy if things were held up for three weeks while you developed a plan as to what you're going to do with those soils. So. I guess from our perspective, you know, we're looking for practical solutions to this problem. We have had a good um, working relationship with the Ministry of the Environment. What RCCO did, I guess, uh, over two years ago, we started a roundtable where we brought uh, municipal uh, associations together, AMO, the Ontario Good Roads Association, uh, various uh, construction firms, uh, those in the consulting industry, uh, legal minds, uh, people from the financial community, and we only got so far. Um, Certainly, uh, you know, there was an understanding uh, from MOE of what needed to be done, but again, they, they are uh, more or less an enforcement agency. So in terms of the practical solutions, uh, we've now created a steering committee. MOE has told us that uh, with their best management uh, practice document, that they would be willing to look at something that our industry is going to develop that we hope will dovetail into it. So there's no um, uh, one silver bullet solution. as. Uh, uh, we've been talking about, but there's probably a multitude of solutions, some of them more technical, some of them perhaps practical. But what we're finding right now, and I'll just keep on talking without looking at the slides and we'll get to some of this during the Q&A, but uh, there's heightened concern uh, by a lot of municipalities around the greater Toronto area about uh, what soil is accepted uh, within their boundaries and uh, what their future liability might be. And uh, one municipality recently east of Toronto um, uh, implemented a site alteration bylaw which essentially uh, has been called by some politicians as a no-fill bylaw. They're only going to accept soils from within their own boundaries and in addition to that to add insult to injury they increase their fees dramatically. Our concern as a construction industry is if this approach is replicated across the region then the transport costs are going to be that much higher. So um, the case studies that we looked at were between 2009 and 2011 with that 4 to 18 percent. We think um, that may be uh, uh, sort of replicated over the next year or two with similar double-digit increases. So that's not sustainable from a financial perspective with in many cases soils that have been impacted by salt may not be of the toxins that we're talking about for certain uh, you know, heavy industrial uses. So we need a solution again that recognizes um, soil as being uh, a beneficial uh, use as opposed to something that's a waste. So as I said, I've probably covered some of this. Uh, we are pursuing the non-regulatory approaches right now. Just to add my political thing, because most of my um, working world is uh, you know, around Queen's Park and dealing with politicians and so forth. 
in a minority government situation, it's that much more difficult to implement regulations. So we have to come up with our own best management practices. And with the red light flashing, I will wrap it up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeanette Southwood, as Al mentioned, and I'm the last speaker that stands between you and your bar ticket. I'll be referring to your bar ticket briefly when I get to my last slide, so you'll, you can consider that to be the segue to Al, and of course Al will lead you all out of this room in a few minutes after that. So I'm just going to wait for my slide. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, the definition of sustainable cities, and the reason that I'm going to be doing that is because the challenges that have been discussed by the speakers prior to me all at the, uh, the big picture level, at the global level, connect into what are we as a society going to be doing over the next number of years as our population grows, as our cities grow? Are we ready for those challenges? And how are we preparing in terms of how are we handling our contaminated sites? How are we handling our impacted materials? So on this slide, what you'll see are some of the typical characteristics of a sustainable city or a sustainable community. It's actually an amalgamation of Federation of Canadian Municipalities example and a CMHC example. And you'll see some very common characteristics. You can see them actually as you walk outside uh, the Metro Toronto Convention Centre here that relate to uh, walkability between where somebody lives or where somebody works, that relate to how easy is it to get from one place to another if you can't walk, how much fossil fuels are used, uh, is it possible to minimize the amount of fossil fuels, how well do we use other kinds of energies, how well do we use our water or other resources, is waste considered a resource, and then finally, how well are we maintaining our cultural heritage? How well are we maintaining our natural heritage, the uh, natural spaces that surround us? So all of those aspects typically fall into what we would consider a sustainable city. But one of the pressing issues around that, and you'll see in the bottom part of the slide, a uh, statistic that uh, has been quoted quite commonly is that by 2050, 70% of our global population is expected to be urban. And if we are not currently preparing for that time of 2050, knowing that, of course, in 2050 we'll have that much larger a global population, if we're struggling with various challenges now around soil management, around brownfields, around what to do in our communities, imagine how much greater those challenges are going to be in 2050. So let's take you to a few uh, examples around the world. Coincidentally, when Al was uh, uh, talking about the bar being open after our session, it occurred to me that all of the four places around the world that I'm going to be speaking briefly about today are all wine producing regions. And in some cases, the fact that they are wine producing regions uh, spirals back into the concept of the sustainable community. So I'm going to start with South Africa. In this case, uh, the picture that you see in front of you is a picture of Durban, South Africa. It's a beautiful city. If you're a soccer fan, you may be familiar with it because it was the location of one of the FIFA soccer, uh, the, one of the FIFA uh, World Cup uh, soccer games or a series of soccer games. And uh, you'll see that Durban is on the water. It's an oceanside city. It's one of the largest cities on the eastern coast of Africa. And as one of the largest cities in a subtropical climate on a waterfront that includes a beach, the very large tourism uh, aspect to its economy, Durban needs to be very aware of what are the challenges around rising sea level, what are the challenges around extreme climate, increasing wind speeds, increasing temperatures. And one of the things that Durban is doing to prepare for these challenges is looking at its land use and it's looking at greenfields redevelopment specifically and looking at food security and how is food security connected into the kinds of decisions that they're making about whether to redevelop a brownfield or whether to redevelop a greenfield. So from Durban, I'm going to take you to Japan and the city that you'll see uh, in that slide with a canal is a city in Japan that's well known to many of you, even though you may not uh, be uh, readily uh, 
uh, readily recognize it, it's the city where a lot of the Godzilla movies were filmed. And in fact, this particular city, in addition to being the place where the Godzilla movies were filmed, it has a famous castle, the castle where Godzilla overcomes uh, whichever enemy it happens to be fighting at that time, uh, is typically located at that castle. And over the years, as it stopped being a location of movies, and it began to also be a location for the automotive industry. So the canal that you see in that slide has alongside it many, many small brownfields properties. It was used as the location of a number of industries over several years. And as those industries became less and re less relevant, that community decided that instead of pushing for redevelopment of the brownfield, it was going to leave it fallow. Because as you go further into that slide, as you go to the top of that slide, that's the center of the city. They're having an urban heat island problem an urban heat island problem that then leads to energy-related challenges. And they've decided, let's leave the brownfields fallow. Let's take the natural way that winds blow into the city, use that canal area and the fallow brownfields to draw cooling sea air into the center of the city, reduce our energy use, and therefore reduce our impacts around heat islands. So from there, and I see that the red light is, is uh, beeping on me or uh, clicking on me, I'm going to take you very quickly to Canada and Australia. The Canada picture is actually a picture from BC, so once again, a great wine producing region. And it's from Nanaimo, British Columbia, where they looked at their brownfields and looked at how can we take some innovative ways to redevelop brownfields to manage materials on site, to manage materials in a way that allow us to capitalize on our waterfront and revitalize our urban center. So from British Columbia, I'll take you quickly now to Australia, where in Australia, they've had uh, a very active uh, aggregates industry. In Australia, they've also had an acceleration of uh, the growth of their urban centers. And the picture that I have there is a picture from a, an aggregate uh, location, former aggregate location outside of Melbourne. It was built 50 years ago. The city grew around it. In the city, there was a challenge around space for housing, of course, with the drive, the sustainable city's drive to live close to where one works. The owner of that particular aggregate's location decided that it was going to use some methods to be able to redevelop that property so that materials could be kept on site and so that it could be easily reused for residential purposes. Won't go into a lot of detail right here, but it was very innovative and a great win both for the property owner as well as the community. I'm going to wrap up by saying that in all of these examples, in all of these examples, we see the challenges posed by what we consider to be sustainability, the overlap of environment, society, and the economy. And how we make our decisions is the final aspect of what I'd like to talk about today. Ensuring that we make a balanced decision between environment, society, and the economy we look at some of the tools that are out there to help us to use it, tools, for example, like Gold Set, tools that have been developed by others, and bring into our conversation about how we manage soils, how we manage brownfields, all of those aspects. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Thank you Jeanette and, and all panelists, uh, particularly uh, Jeanette, I appreciate your segue from wine to Godzilla and into a, a balanced solution. Uh, you're always bang on the mark. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, open it up to the panel discussion. I have a couple of prepared uh, uh, panel questions that I'll present, and then we'll uh, open it up for others. My first question is uh, for the panel, but it probably focuses more on uh, Dave, Andy, and Jeanette. But I've got a good one for you, uh, Jason. Uh, to all panel members, what might be the best approach in getting positive support and engagement by local municipalities to support activities and facilities at the local level that would be involved in sustainable soil reuse activities. And I'll let you go first, Jeanette, because you went last. Sure, certainly. Thank you. Um, first, I'm just going to check to make sure I gather you can all hear me now. I think that uh, local engagement is very important in the um, decision to 
redevelop an impacted site. And I know that you'll be hearing more about this from David also, because David and I have had a number of conversations over the years about the importance of engaging local business owners, local residents, in what is the vision for their neighborhood? What is the vision for their local area? And understanding what are their needs? What are their needs, first of all, from an environmental perspective? Are they concerned about uh, the impacts of having a brownfield close to them? What are their needs from a social perspective? Are there certain kinds of uses that would be particularly valuable to them? And what are their needs from an economic perspective? Are they looking for certain kinds of businesses that might help them to revitalize or a certain kind of housing that might allow them to have a more balanced neighborhood? So certainly local engagement is one aspect that I would consider very important. Couldn't agree more. Andy? Sure. Um, the procurement process, I think, is uh, one area that we need to uh, focus in on. Uh, Currently, uh, for example, let's say if a municipality or a province um, puts out a, a contract for some infrastructure project to be done, uh, most of the time they will just say, you contractor figure out where soils are going to go, you figure out the problems. And that's not necessarily the best approach in terms of uh, a low cost uh, approach. Those who may be doing the low cost bid may not, may not have properly taken into account uh, soil uh, disposal aspect. So I think partnership, although it's an overused phrase, if, if the municipality can work together with the private sector that's responsible for building projects and say, we're going to help you identify appropriate solutions, whether it's an actual site or other things like that, we think we can work better and it'll be better for the environment, better for the economy. So more of a win-win approach. And uh, currently, you know, um, Al and I had a, a recent meeting with um, the agency that's building transit in the city and we asked them, you know, um, have you worked with the contractors to try to come forward with solutions to deal with the soil? Because, I mean, a lot of us saw recently that the solution was let's build some islands in Humber Bay. And I think uh, the regulatory aspect of that would point that as probably being a non-starter with fisheries and everything else. And their uh, response was no, because we think that would uh, limit um, innovative solutions for dealing with soil. So we have a slight disagreement on that. Um, but, uh, you know, partnership is the way to go. Yeah, we're fortunate um, when we go into a community, I guess we're looking at taking a property that in many aspects is again ended its life cycle as an in industry or some other tired use. And uh, so many of the uh, local community groups, and we have to gauge with the community on the redevelopment component of our work. So that's you know what's going to be built, the approvals involved in that. Uh, zoning approvals, planning aspects, all involves community engagement. And many municipalities today also have brownfield programs. So they're very sensitive now to the challenges of brownfield projects. And so when you have public um, sort of on your side as well as the municipality on your side, it's amazing sort of the solutions that you can come up with. In saying all that, there are still significant challenges for people doing this work because there, there are policies that municipalities have that can be an unintended consequences of being a barrier. And, you know, uh, we have municipalities that have drinking water objectives, source water protection, um, and sometimes these other policies uh, can sort of confound the brownfield and how you manage materials and things like that. So it's. Uh, it's a very complex issue. I'd say that the generally, in our experience, is the smaller municipalities, smaller urban centers are better at managing and being flexible at coming up with innovative solutions. The larger municipalities are more process driven and you can bump into some s significant roadblocks. So it's, um, I think we're getting there with more dialogue. Certainly we're headed off to other meetings this week and other regions to talk about you know, better management practices. Uh, for soils, but it is a very important issue touching, I'd say, anyone living in the urban environment today. Thank you, Dave. Do you want to take a crack at that one, Jason, or wait for your question? No, why don't you bring the next one? I, I, don't, I don't think, I agree with anything that's said. I don't think there's much to add. Okay. Well, here's one for you. Sure. This goes right to the point. How supportive is Ontario for leading edge research into innovative remediation technologies? Okay, thanks. So that's something I can speak more easily about. Uh, certainly, Ontario's been uh, at really excellent at providing uh, research support uh, over the last uh, decade or so on uh, innovative technology. In fact, uh, one area they're particularly doing well in is uh, uh, industry uh, academic partnerships and, and really helping you leverage industry money uh, for science and engineering solutions 
so if if uh, uh, if you have uh, exciting new ideas uh, that gets the ear uh, and piques the interest of industry, then uh, leveraging their uh, in kind and their cash uh, involvement. Uh, with government matching funding has been excellent and it's something that uh, I know other jurisdictions like the US would like to emulate. Uh, of course the challenge is uh, doing that uh, for fundamental research that's uh, uh, you know perhaps a little bit further away from from being applied uh, in the real world. The industry then likes to wait to see how that goes and there's that's where we need really strong uh, government funding that's not tied to matching dollars and and also uh, Obviously, in tough economic times and slowdowns, uh, companies are less likely to uh, spend on R&D than they otherwise would. So uh, um, that can create a challenge as well in, in generating that matching, those matching funds. Thank you. Some good news and some challenges, to yeah. say the least. Yeah. That's right. Would any other panel members like to talk to the, that particular issue? Or I have other questions. Yeah, I was just going to say, we've, we've tried to find innovative approaches, again, on our sites. And to Jason's point exactly, you know, we're, you know, obviously we at the end of the day, we have to deliver a return back to, to the people that are investing in our projects. And we can't really be the pioneers taking all the arrows on new technologies. So without some sort of confidence or co-funding or sort of risk mitigation, it's hard for us just to sort of go down a completely different path. And uh, so it's, um, I don't know, there's other opportunities out there with other sites, um, but certainly you know, if we can find other sort of ways to manage risk in the innovation sector, I think there'd be more groups also looking at different ways of dealing with excess soils. I'll just jump in quickly. Um, often uh, people talk about a made in Ontario solution, and I don't think we need to go down that route. There's lots of other jurisdictions that have similar problems. Uh, for example, MOE did bring a delegation in last summer from uh, the Netherlands, and there's a country that is. Uh, extremely space constrained, if I can put it that way. So in terms of the balance uh, that Jeanette talked about in terms of uh, sort of competing or harmonized interests, whichever way you want to look at it, um, you know, they have to deal with something. There's, there's pr potential risks with dealing with soil, but the other uh, side of the coin is uh, you may be hindering economic growth and other objectives like that. So you have to think of those things. Okay, uh, actually this would be my last question to the panel before we open it up. Uh, just quickly, what would you see as a new role of regulators to encourage beneficial reuse of excess soils? Jeanette? I'll start with suggesting that it's important that regulators have a global perspective, that they look at what the needs are of our local province or our local municipalities, but also look at where, because of the pressing issues in other places around the world, uh, you mentioned the Netherlands earlier, the pressing issues around space, uh, in uh, other countries, pressing issues around energy, uh, urban heat island, around uh, food security. But where are the places where there might already have been solutions developed because of the pressing issues that the local folks there have faced? And I'll take us back to a phrase that I'm sure you've heard earlier today, why where matters. Well, if we're in places where some of these challenges have already been faced, then here in Ontario, our local regulators can learn from those challenges and ideally perhaps find a solution or part of a solution that we can apply here. I think having a global perspective is very important. For sure. Dave, Andy? Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. Uh, I, would, I would say, uh, from my perspective, uh, a couple of things that are important. Um, Particularly, uh, our experience is that a lot of, uh, first of all, it's quite a conservative industry, and like you say, that if, if you're uh, going to spend serious money on environmental liability, you want to use a tried and true solution. And so for innovative remediation technologies, we need a lot of field uh, demonstration. We need a lot of field uh, proof to convince uh, that some new technology is going to provide a, a reliable solution. And uh, at the moment, uh, most of our field trials are in the U.S., and I'd like to see more of that done in Canada. Um, to provide confidence to Canadian uh, investors and Canadian uh, uh, developers. Uh, and one of the reasons is that, um, that uh, the regulation in, in some cases is much stricter in the U.S. and so the companies uh, have a lot bigger incentive to redevelop their properties, uh, save themselves some money, and the regulators are 
breathing down their necks to some extent. And maybe that's not, not sure how popular that is, but it, it's very effective in driving them towards uh, seeking out innovative solutions and putting their money into innovative solutions. And there's also some excellent government programs in the US for funding scientifically rigorous field trials. And that's something I'd like to see in Ontario as well. Uh, so that there's a third party auditing the process and can give confidence to, uh, to everybody that this technology is, is good to go. Thank you. Uh, you raise uh, some interesting points about the role of regulators. Uh, the other thing when you look to the US, they certainly have a regime where there's more certainty of process too. So on the business side, if you follow the regulations, you get your NFA or no further action end of liability and the funding through Superfund and other things is there. So. Different regimes, there's a little bit to learn from each, but uh, well said. What I'd like to do now, and recognizing time, uh, maybe time for one or two questions uh, from the floor. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Haridas Sarma from Cartley Center from the University of Guelph. Uh, question to uh, uh, Dr. Jason. In terms of using some of the new technologies, nanotechnology, nanoparticles, are we bringing in something, technology, with a lot of uncertainty in terms of en environmental health uh, uh, associated risks, plus a lot of unknown factors in terms of the migration of those particles uh, through the groundwater and all other uh, uh, things associated with that? Are we jumping on to something new right. to solve a problem that we have created and trying to solve you know, the, the problem created over the past 150 years of the industrial right. development? Right. That's a really uh, excellent question. That's a, very, that's a very good question and something we're very cognizant of. So while we're developing these new uh, nanoparticles, we're developing these new technologies, uh, you know, we also have a parallel stream research program uh, that is also government funded uh, that is very much looking at the risks of nanoparticles to the environment. So if we're looking at, for example, silver nanoparticles that are used largely in industry and also carbon nanotubes that are used in industry. Uh, these are being disposed of to landfill every day with unknown risks. We don't know how mobile they are in the environment, uh, what, how they could eventually reach uh, water sources. So we have another parallel stream research program that's looking at how mobile are pet nanoparticles. And we work with uh, people in ecological health to look at what their risks are to humans and to ecosystems. So there's sort of two tracks going at the same time, and we would certainly never recommend uh, uh, injecting nanoparticles without developing also the confidence that we could do it safely. Good question and uh, good answer. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Just kind of curious if one of the biggest brownfields that we've got in rural Ontario, landfills, is being researched in any way, shape, or form right now, and particularly the nanotechnology, because we're looking in our municipality at mining out some of the old landfills and of course nobody wants to do that especially the regulators because we might have nasties down there that you know shouldn't be there in the first place but we don't want to disturb them so just kind of curious as to what kind of technology or research is going into the biggest brownfield that we have right uh, that's that's also excellent uh, there is quite a uh, there's a fair bit of research going on in uh, understanding leakage from landfills uh, the developing of, uh, of course, technology such as geotechnical membranes and liners for new landfills, but also uh, looking at the le uh, leachate uh, of uh, contaminants from old landfills, understanding the potential for their impacts. Um, so there's a lot of uh, the, sort of the interface between geotechnical and geoenvironmental research going on on landfills. And, uh, the Ge Geotechnical Research Center at Western and also the uh, Geoengineering Center at Queens both have significant programs in looking at landfill leachate. So it's not a forgot. It's not maybe a sexy topic, but it's uh, certainly not forgotten. Thank you. Time for one last quick question, sir. Yeah, sir I was just going to add one more comment. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, around landfills, also there are some activities around mining those landfills for the materials that are in the landfill. So basically going in, using the waste as a resource, taking the materials that are usable and reducing the size and the footprint of the landfill. So it's another aspect of, of how are we dealing with our waste sites. Uh, what I'm going to suggest in, in the essence of time and recognizing that our panelists are here, they're all obviously very knowledgeable people. There is an opportunity after we formally end the session 
for each of you to, to pose questions to the panelists. They are available. So uh, without further ado and recognizing the, the clock, I'd like to thank our panel. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge and capability here. Uh, I think to summarize, there are uh, some challenges in a number of areas. Uh, innovation is always a challenge on the technical side, but in terms of process, we have challenges with uh, the regulatory regime and in producing one that encourages uh, innovation in this area and the application of those innovations in a timely fashion to meet the business needs. There's also uh, a great opportunity here to step back and change the role of regulators to make them enablers and uh, at the end of the day create the kind of environment that encourages innovation and the cleanup and remediation beneficial reuse of soils. And now that you have competition, Belinda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Al. Um, I, I echo Al's comments. We've had a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion uh, this afternoon, and it's clear that um, in terms of innovation and sustainability, each of our panelists has provided um, some very strategic insights to, to what the opportunities are, are around uh, sustainable use and management of soil and of land. And it's really important that the dialogue continue, um, including at the community level. So the engagement of all the key stakeholders that were discussed today um, is really important. And these are the, the stakeholders of industry, academia, government, and the investment community to really help drive the, the long-term and sustainable, sustainable beneficial reuse of soil. So I would like to thank our panelists, Dr. Jason Gerhardt, David Harper, Andy Manahan, Jeanette Southwood, and especially our moderator, Al Durand, for a very lively and interesting discussion. And I'd like to thank all of them as well for generously taking time out of their busy schedules to take part in this forum. And we have a small token of appreciation uh, for, for all of our speakers today. I'd also like to thank Enbridge again for sponsoring this theater and to you, our audience, for your interest and participation. So thank you again and welcome to Discovery.